Welcome, early American literature friends. This video is a guide to a few Emily Dickinson poems. Um, we are going to cover the first batch and, and perhaps the first half of what is listed on the syllabus, beginning with uh, number 207, I Taste a Liquor Never Brewed. And then we're going to go from there. If you're not familiar with Dickinson, she and Walt Whitman are by far and away the two most famous and significant American and prolific American poets of the 1800s, the 19th century. You see here, she was born on it in 1830, uh, died in 1886. She lived most of her life in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, she spent some time at Amherst Academy um, and then at Mount Holyoke Female Cemetery, she left Mount Holyoke Female Cemetery, moved home, and essentially lived at her parents' home the rest of her life after she left um, Mount Holyoke Seminary. Uh, she left because she didn't feel like she was a good fit. She didn't feel like she was committed enough to really fit in there. Um, she only published 10 poems and one letter in her lifetime, but she left behind after her death. It was discovered that she had left behind um, close to 1,800 poems uh, she had sewn them, a bunch of them together in what are now called fascicles. Um, and so there's some dispute over like what to name them, what to call them, how to group them together, if you should leave them grouped the way she grouped them, or if you should group them, if they should be grouped um, more topically. Uh, there is some dispute and debate over her legacy. Um, if, the, if they should be grouped together thematically, like some of the poems about death or about the immortal soul or, or things like that. Um, they explore all different kinds of things. There is a line in our textbook in the Emily Dickinson introduction that has always been really useful to me. And they sort of make the argument that most of Dickinson's poems, there are three kinds of Dickinson poems, mostly. There are propositions where she proposes some idea or some possibility or, or some thought, it's almost like a thought experiment. There are definitions where she tries to demonstrate or illustrate or define some concept in this sort of crossover scientific definition kind of way where she artistically tries to scientifically define something. So you've got propositions, definitions, and the third kind is intense dramatic scenes, what they call in the textbook intense dramatic scenes, where she shows you some moment or scene of intense drama or action or emotion, heightened emotion or something like that. We're going to try to cover at least one kind of all of those in this, in this Dickinson um, unit. Like I said, we're going to start with 207, I Taste a Liquor Never Brewed. Um, so let's jump over there. I Taste a Liquor Never Brewed. I'm going to try and make this bigger so it's vis more visible to you guys watching the video. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankard scooped in pearl. Not all the Frankfurt berries yield such an alcohol. Um, this poem is sort of a proposition about becoming intoxicated, but not on alcohol, not on liquor, that you can become intoxicated on nature and natural feelings, this sort of natural high. So this is sort of, I always read this as a sort of proposition poem that I taste a liquor never brewed. I taste an, a thing, an intoxicating thing, but it's not something that was brewed and fermented. Um, inebriate of air, am I? So she said she's inebriated just by breathing the sort of air and the, the um, spring air. Debauche of dew, if you know debauche, that's a word about like being debauched, being intoxicated, being drunk and acting wild. Reeling through endless summer days from ends of molten blue, like the blue sky. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the fox club's door, the drunken bee, the bee that is like getting pollen out of one flower to another and it's sort of like drunk on pollen. When butterflies renounce their drams, drams an old timey word for like drinks of liquor, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats. If you don't know seraphs, that's another word for angels. Seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler. Tippler, somebody tipping back a glass to drink. To see the little tippler, that, that would be the speaker in the poem, leaning against the sun. So again, you have all these images of natural intoxication, like bees intoxicated by pollen um, and butterflies drunk, uh, drunk on nature, and the speaker in the poem um, drunk on like the sky and the air and the sunlight and those kinds of things. So this is this sort of proposition about being inebriated or intoxicated just on nature and on natural elements. 
The next one that I want to discuss is what is usually number 236. Some, some keep the Sabbath going to church. Um, this is another proposition poem where she is proposing that you can be religious and connect with God without going to church. That's the proposition of this poem. It, it's almost, you get the first line, some keep the Sabbath going to church. Some people need to go to church to, to be religious and to connect with God. I keep it staying home with a Bible link for a chorus turn and orchard for a dome. So you have this, there's a transcendentalist sentiment in this poem, which is that she makes this connection, which is if you, if you in Christian iconography and Christian ideology, if you accept that God is the maker of the world, well then when you connect with the natural world, you are connecting with God and, and his creation and, and engaging with and communing with God through his creation. And that's what you're getting a lot of is this transcendentalist overforce connecting, uh, engaging as a part of the natural world imagery here. Some keep the Sabbath, I go into church, I keep it staying home. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. That is like the, the gown, the formal robe. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton, she means a bird, sings. So you don't, you don't need the formal singing at the church. You can have the birds singing in the garden, in the orchard. God preaches, a noted clergyman. So again, that transcendentalist, like you can, if you listen, you can hear God through his creation, through nature. And the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. This is the sort of, prop, especially the sort of proposition of this, like heaven is not this destination. It's this journey that you go on by engaging with God's creation and, to, and, and engaging and communing with it. That is one of her more famous poems, and especially one of her more famous religious poems, especially if you understand, if you think back to what I said about her leaving the seminary, not feeling committed, you see this, her commitment to God and to Christianity um, and to formal, and, but against formal religion and the sort of going to church and the rituals, what she would understand is like the rituals and formalities that she doesn't feel are necessary to engage with some higher power. The next poem is by far and away her most famous love poem. This is, uh, this is often number two, um, poem number 269, Wild Nights, Wild Nights. This is a proposition poem too. And the proposition, you can see the proposition in the language. Um, wild Nights, Wild Nights, were I with thee? If I were with you, if I were with you, we'd be having the Wild Nights. Wild Nights sh should be, so they would, if we were together, wild nights should be our luxury. Um, you get that proposition here of like, if we were together, this is what we'd have. Feudal the winds to a hard and poor, done with the compass, done with the chart. There's an overarching metaphor here about like a ship being out at sea looking for harbor, looking for port versus the person that's found the, the, the person that's found who they want to be with, they're in port. So they're done with the compass, done with the chart, done with the like um, direction finding, the way you would find your direction, especially back in the 1800s, the way you would navigate across the water. Um, so you don't need a compass, you don't need a chart, because you're in port, because you found where you want to be. Rowing in Eden, uh, this is, there's the obvious, like if we were together, it would be Eden, it would be paradise. Ah, the sea, might I but more, more in that, more in that definition is like anchor, tie up, stay put, might I but more tonight in thee. So it is that like, if if I you know anchored with you um, and settled down with you, uh, we'd be in Eden. There's that proposition of paradise. Might I? So all the there's all that propositional language. Were I with you, um, should be our luxury. Might I? But more. So there's all this sort of proposition of here's what we would have if we got together. Like I said, this is her most famous love poem. Dickinson very famously. There's a lot of debate and dispute about her sexuality. She she was never in, as far as we know, she was never in any serious relationship. There's some, again, like d debate about her sexuality, debate about her, whether, you know, whether she was, there's several different propositions about what her sexuality or if she was totally asexual. Um, this is, like I said, though, her most famous love poem, and there is some, like, intensity of emotion here, and people use it to read several that, like, people are often read this as, like, who might she di be directing these sentiments towards? There's no certain answer, for sure. The next poem is 
Uh, three set what is often called number 372 after great pain a formal feeling comes um, this one is often read as a sort of definitional poem because this is a lot of her poems are wrestling with sort of scientific premises I don't want to say a lot but there is a significant number of her poems that are wrestling with some kind of scientific premise and this poem is taking a sort of um, physical experience which is like getting frostbite or getting scar tissue like nerve endings being damaged and losing feeling in this sort of physical way and transferring it or transposing it into emotional into like emotional experience too and like feeling numb and feeling numb by some difficult experience after great pain a formal feeling comes and she means formal like you're just going through the motions you're sort of numbed and, and just going through the motions because, you, because you've been so shocked and harmed by the um, great pain. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. You're just shut down, your nerves are dead. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore in yesterday or centuries before? Again, the image of the stiff heart, the sort of like scarred or numbed heart, feeling that. The feet mechanical go around, so you're, like, you're just moving mechanically like a, like a mechanism, um, like, like a machine, not like a person. A wooden way, you're like wood, you're like a puppet, just going through the motions of ground or air or ought, regardless grown, a quartz contentment, like a stone. Again, like you're sort of numb, you're hardened like stone um, in that sort of scarred way. This is the hour of lead, lead like this sort of heavy, weighed down, hard, dense substance. You're just, you're sort of like metal or stone. Remembered, if outlived, a freezing person recollects the snow, first chill, then stupor, then the letting go. She's, she's talking about hypothermia and freezing to death, but she is saying that it is an emotional incident or emotional damage or emotional trauma is much like physical trauma. If you outlive it, the way that you remember it is the chill, then the, the stupor, the numbness, then the letting go. And it like um, the sort of hypothermia and freezing to death, it has the similarity to emotional trauma which is like being chilled, being, you know, going cold, be going numb, and then, and then you let something go in this sort of process of grief or trauma or processing difficult experiences or something like that. So she's making, she's proposed, there is this proposition here that emotional trauma is similar, similar to physical trauma in the sort of process of going through it. Um, and then the last one, but a longer poem because I could not stop for death. This poem, uh, is this is an intense dramatic scene because it is giving you uh, what you're getting right here is this intense dramatic scene here where she goes through uh, this moment uh, moment of death and then the moments after death where death the grim reaper or something like that carries you into the, the eternity and immortality um, and you get this, there is this proposition happening here because I could not stop for death. He kindly stopped for me, the carriage held, but just ourselves and immortality. And so that I could not stop for death. Nobody wants to stop for death. Nobody like death comes for you. You don't, m most people don't normally come for death. He, he comes and gets you and picks you up the carriage. Like he picks you up. You get in the carriage with him. The carriage held but just ourselves in immortality, the sort of like eternity, the endless time, the inf you're going into infinity. We slowly drove. He knew no haste. And I had put away my labor and my leisure too. Um, the put away my labor and leisure, like I put away my life, both the work and the sort of free time to play, for his civility. We passed the school where children st strove. This is the sort of like the world is going on without me. I'm going into eternity. I'm going into infinity and the world is going on, kids are playing at school, at recess in the ring. We pass the fields of grazing grain, like the world is going on, you know, crops are out there growing. We pass the setting sun, so we pass the sort of like we're going outside of time. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only told. She's talking about the, the human body you get wrapped up, especially before um, funeral homes and the processing of bodies like embalming and things like that. People would be wrapped up in, uh, um, in these death wraps and things like that, which is what she's talking about here. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. That's an obvious allusion to the grave, the, the grave piled up after the body is buried. The roof was scarcely visible. Again, the grave, the cornice in the ground, the, the sort of house um, and the tombstone. 
since then to centuries and yet feels shorter than a day because again she's gone past the sun outside of time she's gone into immortality i first surmised the horse's head it's like the four horsemen carrying, carrying you the the or just the horses um, pulling the carriage death's carriage carrying you into immortality i first surmised the horse's heads were headed towards eternity again like this sort of the intensity that's being depicted here is the moment when you step outside of this world and this life and this sense of time and go into eternity um so you're getting this um intense scene of stepping out of this life and the sort of bound boundaries of this life and into um, immortality and eternity i hope that helps you understand these five poems um I, 207, I Taste the Liquor Never Brewed, 236, Some Keep the Sabbath, 269, Wild Nights, um, 372, After Great Pain, A Formal Feeling Comes, and then this one, 479, one of her more famous poems, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, which is this intense dramatic scene. Hope this helps you understand these five poems. Hope you are doing well.